Uh, so as I said, my name is Aaron Jin, and I'm going to go through a brief history of who I am. Uh, so currently, I am the product manager at Everlane. At Everlane, we make clothing like this. Uh, basically, our vision for the world is if you had to build a J Crew today, what were the things you would do differently? Uh, and we sort of target this casual fashion uh, area. And there I run uh, products uh, from the technology side, I also run data science, and I also run direct marketing, so anything that has to do with traditional internet marketing, uh, my team runs. I also was a growth uh, product manager at StumbleUpon, and then also started a political nonprofit called Lincoln Labs, which advocates for center-right technologists in DC and, and around the world, actually. Uh, and it makes a little more sense that I worked on the Mitt Romney campaign. He was uh, the 2012 Republican nominee for president, and I was his uh, growth product manager. Worked on things ranging from small dollar donations to integrating new technologies to uh, viral flows. I'm also known for my writing on my blog, which is agint.com, uh, and then also I wrote the uh, was it defining growth hacker thing, I don't know, like two years ago on TechCrunch that uh, a lot of people still cite. So when I, was, when I was thinking about this topic, I like to use metaphors. And I, this isn't my first presentation in another country. I was uh, actually in Japan. I did a talk at TechCrunch Disrupt. And lots of my uh, sort of, I guess, US pop culture metaphors just did not make any sense. So I decided to go with a very uh, uh, easy one, which is, you know, what is this? It's a, the treasure map, right? And a lot of people, when I think about growth, they think of it as an, oh, like, at the end of this tunnel, there's lots of gold and jewels. And like, I'm going to become wealthy. And then, you know, everything's great. Uh, and uh, like, this is, this is sort of the path to go down. But you don't really kind of know the trajectory, right? And there's lots of dangers on the path, right? You could run into Captain Barbosa, or you can like, you know, go into the volcano and you know, sort of die on the way, right? So there, there are lots of pitfalls, and you're thinking about how do I develop a, a good growth strategy. And so it kind of boils down to, I think, two things, which is where should I start? You know, I have all this opportunity in front of me. I can kind of do whatever I want. I'm startup, there's, there's nothing impeding my way. Uh, what should I focus on first? And the second is, what do I need to do? Uh, when, you, when you pick a trajectory to go after, uh, you know, that's like the high level strategy, and then you need to figure out the like, execution side. So what's gonna be the day to day to figure out if I'm actually going down the right path? So I think, where, where should I start falls into uh, a couple of areas, and you'll see a lot of my behavioral economics background sort of show up in this presentation. So where should I start as a function of supply, right? So every given distribution channel, uh, you have lots of different opportunities, like am I gonna do press, am I gonna do paid? Uh, these are all like the supply outs of, out, out there that you can potentially uh, buy. The second is that you are not alone in this fight, right? Uh, you are battling against other people, and you may unfortunately not want pricing to be so high, but that is a reflection of the competitive market. So there are other actors that are involved in your decision to what, what strategy to take. And the second is uh, what I call product growth fit, which is what are you good at, right? What are you excel at, you as the company? What is the thing that you offer that you can, that basically is your differentiating factor that really shows in the public square? So the supply side. So this is basically every available distribution channel. So when you're thinking about, you know, how do I start finding my growth channel, you should really think of everything that you have in front of you. Because uh, potentially every channel is an opportunity. It just may not be the best opportunity. Uh, so for example, myself, which is a 26-year-old Asian man who lives in San Francisco, there are lots of potential ways you can engage me, right? You could do television, uh, like, you know, advertise on Fox News, or you can advertise The Economist, or you can do mobile ads, or you can, you know, hit me up on Facebook, or you can do email marketing. So lots of ways you can pinpoint, like, an, an, an individual given audience. But as I said before, not all channels are created equal, right? Each of those that I've mentioned have different cost structures, have different availability of access based upon how much you want to spend, and also may not make sense for you as a product. So shout out to my buddy Justin. Uh, so Traction Book has the best sort of coverage of all of the available supply. And here's just like, you know, random five that I listed. But there, there's, 
In general, they sort of map out 19 different channels. And I've mentioned here like viral marketing, press, direct mail, social media content marketing. I mean, there's, there's, there's uh, you know, different types of referral strategies. Even within the social media marketing, right, you have like, you know, anything ranging from Badoo to Twitter to Facebook. Uh, so there's the, the, I'm not gonna cover how many different channels you go down, but if you just think about everywhere you could possibly advertise, it's, it's a ton. Uh, even within the given 19 that they list in their book, uh, there's even within, the, there's like, you know, subsets and subsets and subsets. So one of the, the articles that I enjoyed writing the most, which was uh, on, the, on the, the next web, was how growth hacking came to be. And the reason why I wrote this was uh, I, have, I have a philosophical background, and I was thinking about why does this, at this moment uh, in time, are people interested in growth hacking? And I think that the causes uh, of, of why growth hacking came to be is more insightful than I think a lot of, like, you know, let's just talking about conversion rate optimization, right? So this is basically explaining, like, the why. So the first is channel instability. Uh, how many people in the audience actually build apps on Facebook? You can raise your hand. Nobody here builds apps on Facebook. No app, okay, you got one. I recommend, uh, it should be a lot more than this, but so like four or five. So if, if any of those four or five you can, people you can talk to, Facebook has basically gone down a path of screwing over everyone who's ever actually invested in Facebook. But when you first started with a Facebook open graph, which was a revolutionary idea of people being able to build apps onto a platform and be able to freely access users, it was like wild, wild west, right? You could build an app that takes advantage of someone's data to like, you know, hijack other user photos and randomly tag people in it and, you know, randomly link to your site. Like it was, it was crazy days and, you know, people were growing like mad. I had, I had one friend that built an app and got, you know, five million users in two months. Today, it's very different. Today, there's lots of approval processes. They basically also, in the, in the uh, algorithm they show in the news feed, they're very uh, judicious on people's growth acceleration. So basically, if you are on Facebook and you have a viral app, you basically will be hit down and Facebook will say, no, 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 you are growing too quickly. So that's a very different from the early phases. Uh, or you could even list off that, um, uh, like, SEM prices or uh, display ads. Like, every, like the, the, the way that channels are interacting with each other and how your competitors and yourself are interacting with it will drastically change whether or not it's a good channel or a bad channel. Uh, channel saturation. The Facebook Open Graph is a classic example about how that when, something, when people saw something successful, like within a year or two, it was no longer successful. People were jumping in, throwing millions and millions of dollars at Facebook and driving up the prices and pushing people sort of out of the system. For example, Facebook's, the, like the top five uh, Facebook spenders on uh, paid is about the same five companies over and over again month to month. Most of them are social gaming companies uh, or like massive brands or banks. And these people throw buku money for really no logical reason, right? Like I, there was one, uh, bank I heard that was spending almost uh, $5,000 to acquire a customer, right? There's, there's almost no company in this room that can compete with that, right? That means they're always gonna win, they're always gonna spend a ton more money than yourself. And that's because, you know, they, they've sort of read the, the press about how awesome Facebook advertising is, and out of that, it pushes everybody out, right? It pushes all the small players out uh, because the, the demand into the network is far higher. So. Out of this, it's, it's very difficult to have a long, sustainable, single channel that you're investing in that will be driving your growth because once you are successful, your competitors will immediately jump in there and basically dilute the channel to where it's no longer effective. From that, arbitrage window is very small. So we're talking about, uh, you know, five years ago, you had like maybe two or three years of being the only player in a particular channel. Now you're talking about a year or so, maybe less. And so when Pinterest rolls out their ad product, you're talking about that probably being successful for maybe eight months, where it's cheap, effective. After that, it drops off, you know, gradually, 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 and things get more expensive, and eventually equals, a, a, you know, equals out of the equilibrium that was far lower than you be, began, began with. So your window for having great success on a particular channel 
is, and being the only player there and growing massively is, is quite small. This is one reason why you see a lot of business development deals going on with uh, particular social networks between different partners. Uh, you know, Facebook working with Android to integrate their chat mechanism, for example. And, and this is because of this narrow arbitrage, because people are so quickly to jump into particular channels that you have to create defenses for yourself, which is a business development deal, right? Which is you're the only person who has access to this distribution uh, to prevent people from spoiling, uh, you know, spoiling a channel. And then marketing fatigue. This is, you know, just classic marketing fatigue that over time people just get really bored of looking at your ads. Uh, or your website or your product. Um, the classic example is, you know, retail. They change out every single one of their ads, uh, you know, probably about a couple times a month to keep you constantly interested. So competitors. The, the, one of the things that took me a while to finally realize is that your competitors are the best place to start, right? You're, you should assume that they're, they're rational actors uh, and that they're, they're working in their best interest. Uh, growth is a, as I says, says on the slide, growth is a public exercise, right? Because you're trying to acquire customers, you're trying to activate them. It's visible to everybody. Like the, just, just go through, you know, the, like previous presentation, right? All those different things, right? Those are, these are all visible public that you can go test yourself and figure out. And, and this is a, a great place to see what, what your competitors are thinking are working and where they're doubling down investing in. So here's a, an example. Uh, Uber is, I don't know, how long has Uber been in Istanbul? Right? I, don't, I saw, I opened up my Uber app and there was cars running around. Uh, how many of you have heard of Lyft? Lyft? All right. So this is, this is a classic example of what your competitors are doing, right? So Uber offers $1,000 uh, to drivers to switch and Lyft offers 500. And they drive around the city, they advertise the drivers, they do cold calls because this is the way that they see growth happening. And they're both competing into the same channel, they're both competing and, and going after each other uh, in the same exact way. Uh, so this is like basically competitor to competitor, they're both seeing this is what you're doing, so I'm basically gonna spoil your channel or I'm gonna try to take advantage of you in a new way. So it's very obvious, right? These trucks are driving around, they're only, they're appealing to you, know, you to join. Product growth fit. Basically defined as a, it's the most efficient and effective way to distribute your product. And uh, you know, the classic is product market fit. This was sort of, the, sort of you know, the secondary step, which is okay, now you have, it's solid on the product side, you know, your retention looks good, everything's great, so how do I match that to a distribution channel? Uh, this is, the set, I think, the second uh, biggest test for a company and its viability. Simply, you could ask yourself, like, what are you good at? Like, what does your product do? What is the output of your product? Uh, you can think of this in, in a way of saying, like, what does your product do? Is it an open box or closed box? That's a metaphor I like to say of, you know, if you're like a financial institution, right? People are not gonna be wanting to go and share their financial information on Facebook, right? Or healthcare, whatever it is, that's a closed box. They come in, they accomplish something, they, you know, they're interacting with you and they leave, right? They're, they're not gonna be creating a social exhaust out of that. Versus if you're a social app or you're a photo app, the goal is, is proliferation of the content, right? So you don't wanna be creating a growth strategy oriented around, like let's say if you're a social product that is around a closed idea, right? So, or a closed box. Closed box strategies are things like heavy on paid, uh, heavy on, any sort of direct form of advertising. Versus open box strategies are very oriented around organic referral, virality, that sort of stuff. Uh, and, that, and that's a natural reflection of what the product does and how it works. Also, what is your stage? Every, every company goes through different phases of growth and what they focus on. Uh, if you're a small stage company, moving numbers by you know, 10 or 15% of a, like say, of a nominal rate of a couple thousand is a big deal. Versus if you go to Twitter, and you say those same things, or be like, I don't really care. Like, you know, Twitter, we're at 250 million users. Our goal is to move Mao by a million, right? So stage of life of a company relates to how you should be investing in a particular channel, and certain channels that you would be investing in no longer are viable because it's just not worth it to focus on. And I'll elaborate a little bit more uh, about that uh, later. It's product growth fit. So this is an example. So Airbnb grew through scarcity of events. Uh, some of the most classic examples of their success was the Democratic National Convention in 2008, uh, South by Southwest. 
the, the situation that their product is most useful in is when originally, when they first came out, this was sort of their early stage growth, was when there was no hotel rooms, right? And that happens usually during mass conferences or, or conventions. And so they would basically heavily advertise the people going to these regions, both through like guerrilla marketing and then also through some paid stuff, uh, to you know, get, get a hold of these people who don't want to pay $800 for a hotel room, but they're going to stay next to you know, at a nice house down the street. Uh, Teespring, which is a crazy growing uh, t-shirt company in the Valley, has been around for a few years. Their main growth channel is affiliates. Uh, they, their, their product basically allows you to create custom t-shirts really easily, uh, you know, and then sell them. And so they're, I don't know, like probably overwhelming majority, let's say, of their growth comes from people taking those t-shirt ideas of being like, you know, uh, I'm with Bob, I'm with Aaron, I'm with Chris, right? And they take those t-shirts and they basically throw them all across the internet. And, and people are using this like easy design tool as a means of, of, uh, uh, creating money, right? So uh, creating money for Teespring and themselves. So this is a natural fit for what Teespring does and in their growth channel. Stumble upon uh, browser extensions. Uh, you know, Stumble upon's been around forever, uh, and the the most logical place for them to exist whenever I mean this was like, you know, 2000. I think it started in 2002, right? Search wasn't very prolific. It was difficult to find stuff. You know, no, the internet was still really uh, naive and young, and so StumbleUpon grew primarily through having that button on in your browser that you push whenever you're bored, and it launched you into like a new experience. And it's very natural for for how StumbleUpon even works today, for like that being the case back in like Web 1.0 days. So here would be an example of things that kind of don't make sense for like Airbnb. And I'll elaborate a little bit on the next slide about why so. Everybody focused on getting virality, right? It's not really something that you're like, hey, let's post to Facebook this awesome house, right? That's not really, unless you're like looking for a house to buy, not to stay, kind of doesn't really feel right. Or Teespring, paid advertising, like their, their product is t-shirts. It's a very, very low uh, revenue, like, you know, your margin on it is very small. So paying a bunch of people to join or paying for even particular t-shirts, like I'm with Bob, custom t-shirt, is you don't have a lot of wiggle room there to, you know, uh, to make it a profitable venture to invest in paid advertising. Uh, Some of my SEO, like we're an, we're an iframe website, so like why would you be doing that? And so what you're looking for is the bottomless well, like a, a channel for you that if you constantly throw into it, you always get something back. Right? If, you, if you saw in the previous slide, or in the previous slide, you had those those channels that some of them do, like, you know, for example, when I work at StumbleUpon, I invested in SEO, but you shouldn't be investing in less efficient channels for your product unless you're at scale. Because at some point, your original sort of organic growth that drives your product forward will be even sort of being ready tapping out, and you want to, like, you know, layer your growth strategy, right? So over time, you want to be adding things, you know, as you scale, but if, if you're, like, let's say a social product, yeah, Facebook did do paid advertising later on in its life, but that was because when they already had like you know 300 million users, and they could afford a a, a poor a poor uh, you know long run uh, lifetime value for their user through paid because they had you know millions and millions of users already on their products. So don't be investing in a channel that is less efficient for what your product does unless you have the means to actually do it. Uh, and product fit to product growth fit, but they don't do one for the other, right? So don't be like, hey, we're gonna be throwing a bunch of, you know, referral stuff into a social product, and we're gonna heavily invest in that when, like, it itself, your product market fit may not even currently be established yet. So next is what I need to do. Uh, so we'll talk about the best product fallacy, which is uh, another sort of phraseology that that I termed. Uh, and iteration presuppositions, basically when you think about testing, it's not just, you know, oh, let's run a bunch of landing page tests or a bunch of assumptions and ideas that goes into testing that makes it more effective or doesn't. You shouldn't be testing for testing's sake. That's a complete waste of time. Uh, channel potential. This is the, what I spoke about earlier of like, when, when you're thinking about, um, you know, where should I be going, uh, you, need to be think, you need to be saying how much do I actually need to move numbers by? You know, it, that will cut off a lot of areas that you uh, don't want to be investing or don't need to be investing in. It's the best product fallacy. The best product means you will win. That is the fallacy. It is not true. Sometimes true, most of the time not. And here, here is here's sort of the, 
the assumptions behind the fallacy that, that, that a lot of people have. The rational consumer, uh, we're, we're not. I think that's pretty, you know, that's pretty, pretty uh, prima facie. Like it's pretty at its face true. Like, you know, we, we make shortcuts all the time in the way we make decisions. Uh, we don't have, you know, we don't have perfect information, right? We don't have the ability to compare products rationally in like, you know, sort of an A to B scenario when you're looking, even like let's say you're at the mall. Low exchange cost, uh, as in the ability to switch between goods is, is insignificant. Uh, all these, like when people say like the best product wins, they're assuming all these things that are wrong. They're, they're in, you know, from my, my economics training, these are true in great academic scenarios, right? This is a great way of discussing how, you know, market, market clears. But when you're talking about the real world, people do not behave this way. Uh, you know, you're, let's say you're trying to switch a different cell phone plan, right? You don't know all the available you know, the, the, per, like the cell phone possibilities. Like, it's just, it's just not feasible. Uh, and low exchange costs, right? You, you have the, whenever you're switching to something, you, there is the bias already there because you want to stay in your current plan. And to add more support to this, uh, I'm gonna name people who are a lot smarter than me. Uh, if anyone tells you products sell themselves, they probably want you to fail. Phil Liven, who founded Evernote. Most businesses actually get zero distribution channels to work. Poor distribution, not product is the number one cause of failure. Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal, uh, I think his first semester in Facebook, founder of Fun, um, one of the most successful people in the Valley. Uh, his, his partner in crime, Blake Masters, who wrote Zero to One with him. Uh, the conventional thinking is that great products sell themselves. If you have a great product, it will, it will inevitably reach cons consumers, but nothing is further from the truth. Here's an another example of why this is true. Best-selling cars in the US, these are Honda CRV, small SUV, Honda Accord, mid-size SUV, Honda Civic um, is uh, the you know, smaller car. What is actually best rated according to JD Power and Associates? Buick Encore, Chevy Malibu, Honda Accent, right? Why is that the case? Marketing, uh, branding of Honda, uh, Honda's distribution channel, lots of these things that basically create a competitive edge in the market. Testing presuppositions. So when you're, when you're thinking about running a test and iterating to see whether or not this is the channel for me, length is very, very important. Extremely, extremely important. One reason why when you're a small company you focus on acquisition is that the testing length is short, right? Your question about what you're answering, whether or not you, the test would be successful or not, is whether or not they signed up, right? They came to the site, sign up, right? So when you think about retention though, how long do you actually need to measure that? Assuming you don't have a model or enough, let's say, you know, enough data to even figure out a predictive model within, you know, one day time period of seven day retention. If you don't have that, you have to run it for at least seven days to figure it out. So every, the testing link determines how long it takes for you to learn something, right? And so when you're a small company, iteration length is, is, is extremely important in determining what metrics you want to focus on and whether or not the channel is going to be viable because you want to move fast, right? You want to know within the day whether or not you're doing something great or do something poor. Iteration impact, like are you doing something that really matters? If, if you, let's say, like, it's a, it's a classic power law problem. Uh, if, let's say that, you know, you have uh, 100 customers and you're going to improve, you know, uh, conversion uh, from 10 to 20%. And that means you're going to get an additional 20 customers, right? So theoretically, that's awesome. But let's say compared to another, th another test, uh, they say equal amount of time, you're going to have that same sort of improvement of acquisition. Like, so you're going to move, let's say, uh, instead of 100 customers, you get 1,000 customers, and you keep the same conversion rate. One of those has a dramatically different outcome, and the other one is like still an awesome improvement, but not comparatively, right? So, but both of those are like the same time investment, if that makes sense. Learning impact, so what do you get out of it? You know, every test, your goal is to learn something. Improving metrics is fantastic. I mean, that's, that's one reason why you run a test. But 80% of the things you run will fail. They won't be, either they won't move numbers, they'll be flat, or it'll be slightly negative. 10% will be like, oh, that's nice, like a nice 5%, 10% improvement. And the other last 10% are amazing things. So most of the time you actually won't be, you know, moving things significantly. And that's okay because what you're doing is you're removing ideas and concepts from your lore in your company, about what your company believes, how it operates, things that are important uh, from the list. Uh, so for example, when I, when I came to Everlane, 
uh, one of the first things I tested was there was this assumption that consumers, when they come to an e-commerce site, behave similar ways. Like they, they, our assumption was like, oh, when I want to come and look at a new t-shirt I want to buy, I want to look at what the t-shirt is compared to against you know, other t-shirts, then I want to see the t-shirt, then I want to buy it. Right? And I was like, no, that's not the way I behave, right? Because usually when I'm ready to, you know, this is sort of how men behave in e-commerce. Men don't really do a lot of like deep investigation. Like they basically kind of know what they want, they go and execute and they're done. And so what I did is I shortened the amount of time frame in which someone could actually go and buy something. I cut about you know, 50% of the steps out where you could just like click one button in your shopping cart and you can go. There's no more like sort of this long discovery process. And within like say a week, we saw that uh, week over week, rev like in our, I guess not week over week revenue, sorry, uh, it would be uh, the iteration versus the control, we saw a 20% increase in revenue but just having this shorter way to check out. Focus. One of, the, one of uh, people I respect the most in the Valley is Simon Rothman. He's one of the most preeminent VCs uh, and expert on marketplace. Startups don't fail for lack of ideas, they fail for lack of focus and prioritization. Uh, and he is most well known for his work in eBay Motors, uh, and I got a lot of this advice uh, from him when, when I was thinking about you know, working in marketplace and e-commerce. Uh, one is a one tooth one month focus on a particular channel. So if you right now are running, I don't know, like five different channels at once and you're trying to figure out how all of them work and you know, this lady is only two people on your team, don't do that. that that's, that's not gonna be helpful for you. Because uh, you're always gonna be investing 30% of your effort, 20% of your effort in a particular channel. And the best thing to do is just pick one and try to destroy it, try to figure out every, Sight angle, like how it goes, you know, look at it from every side. And the only way to do that is to focus on it like 100%. Document, document, document. Like, even if you fail at a test, that's completely okay. Understand why, document it, leave it in, into the corpus of, of lessons for the company to further, you know, realize in the future. Uh, go all out, like, don't shortchange yourself. You want to be optimizing for completeness. You don't want to be leaving, let's say every time you start a channel and you're going you know, down Facebook and Facebook paid, uh, you don't want to leave that with the question of, oh, well, we could have done this, but we didn't do it, right? The, the, you, you didn't get anywhere, right? You're still in the same place you were before. Go until you feel like, okay, this is really, you know, you want to, you want to feel at the end of a one to two month testing period for a particular channel, you want to feel, okay, like I'm completely exhausted. Like there's nothing else I can feel like I can do. We can cut this off the table and you know, refer it to a different point in time. Channel potential. Not every test has the same worth. And particularly, like this is how like, different growth teams uh, you know, back in California think about it. So Twitter's growth team, they're looking for a uh, monthly impact of one million plus on monthly actives, right? So that cuts out a lot of things, things like Landing page optimization. They're like, we don't give a crap about that, right? And, and that's why you see if you have Twitter now, they're focusing on what? They're focusing on discovery. They're focusing on how feeds interact with each other, right? So when you're, when, when you're looking at the scale of the things you're trying to achieve, that will greatly impact your execution, your, your, growth, uh, your growth distribution channel, um, and, uh, and like the things you want to test. At Everlane, we focus on revenue impact of five figures or more. Uh, that cuts out a lot of things that are worthy of testing, but just don't meet what the business goals are. At Facebook, theirs is this probably the most interesting and difficult problem. Their, their thing is like population, uh, or the percentage of internet penetration for the population, right? Like that is an incredibly difficult, think about it, problem to solve, like, because that's one reason they have this uh, internet.org effort of trying to get internet to as many people as possible. Because everyone else, they're sort of just like, you know, we've sort of tapped out. Uh, we need to start investing in people who are like at their youth phase when they're just getting on the internet. That's when we want them to get on Facebook. So they're, they're focusing on different, they're, you know, what they're investing in is like, you know, uh, Wi-Fi and balloons and like, you know, paying for internet access in Chile and handing out phones in Africa. Like completely different things to focus on than we would ever or even Twitter. So here are a couple examples of uh, things I would do according to like, you know, situation. So your product is like social. Your stage is early. So you're saying, you know, maybe you have a couple hundred thousand users and you know, you're starting to see some good traction and you know, what should I do? 
Uh, the first is only free growth. If you're a social network at this stage, you should not be paying for anybody or anything. Uh, that's just, I mean, that's a broad generalization, but it's, it's primarily true. Like, you know, if you are a social network that you're optimizing for visits and sessions, you cannot be paying for people to come back to you every single time because there is not that arbitrage that exists between you know, acquiring a customer for three bucks. There's no way you can be selling for ads for like more than $3 per session. Uh, if you can do that, then you will be you know, the first trillion dollar company in, in the world, uh, but probably can't. High, high network density, I would focus on how does your network interact with each other and what is your penetration in, your, in the friend network or whatever network you're doing? Let's say if you're a design and social network, then your, your, your density of designers in a particular area, which relates to the idea of exclusivity. Do not be focusing on a bunch of random different populations because your goal of a social product is density around a particular idea, whether it's content, friends, whatever it is. Uh, so you, you need to have, be, you know, own one network of, you know, one, or not, not one network, one uh, idea of density uh, like a stumble upon, our, our idea of density was around interests, right? So we wanted to have, we wanted, instead of user to user like similarities, we were focused on like content to content similarities. So how people, uh, you know, whether or not somebody who likes cars is also connected to someone who also likes cars and they could share content around that. Uh, consistent usage, right? This is, uh, as a social network, you're, or you're probably the most important metric. It's, am I getting people to come back on a periodic basis? If so, what is that sort of expected behavior? Uh, are they supposed to come back a weekly basis, monthly basis, whatever it is? Understanding how people use your product will, like, will relate to like, what kind of growth channel you want to go after. Uh, another one, uh, e-commerce mid-stage, just to be you know, closer to Everlane. Uh, the first would be paid on social. Uh, that would be the first thing I would focus on is uh, general social ads perform pretty well for e-com. Uh, so, you know, testing there, investing in that channel, figuring out if Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest new ad product will work for, um, you know, selling goods. Uh, skew proliferation. Uh, there's lots of interesting studies that are public about how uh, skews basically means um, products, product selections. Uh, of how increasing SKU count relates to increasing in revenue and traffic. Uh, and for different companies, it affects people different ways. Uh, for example, on ModCloth, it, it was not linear. It was basically exponential for certain things, like black, black dresses. That had an exponential impact. So the more SKUs they had, an exponential impact on traffic, orders, et cetera. But things for like, let's say, you know, I don't know this example for necessarily for ModCloth, but like, for like for product skew selection of shoes, it may not be maybe like a one-to-one -one relation, right? So skew understanding how your skew count relates to your top line level growth is really important for ecom, uh, on and also it helps manage you know inventory concerns stuff like that. So this is really really important when you're in mid stage is how your product selection varies and drives your revenue because you know if you're getting a bunch of skews and it doesn't drive revenue, then you're basically putting your company at risk of going bankrupt because you have a bunch of exposed risks inside of inventory. Our monthly repeaters, how often do you expect to come back? Uh, whether or not you can drive something once a month or you know, six times a year, that sort of thing. Uh, direct marketing, uh, this would be uh, catalog, traditional ways that people go buy you know, retail goods. Uh, magic, of, so this would be like my, my concluding section. Uh, it would be, uh, people think of uh, this was a blog post I wrote a, a while ago, and, and this is, has anyone seen this movie, The Prestige, right? Awesome movie, it was before Christian Bell got, went crazy. Like this is, this is like a great example about what, when, when people think of growth, they often think of this like, you know, crazy magic th trick that just blows your mind and expects you to come in and throw pixie dust and stuff and it like, you know, magically, you know, uh, balloons. And if you saw in the movie, right, he, he, he invents this, you know, crazy trick that like drives uh, drives his uh, his you know his uh, his competitor completely mad, uh, and you know into a state of like immoral decisions. And all it was his trick was that he had a twin, right? Something completely simple uh, that no one ever thought was 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 the case. Uh, and and so when you're thinking about when you're thinking about growth and you're thinking about uh, investing in um, in this sort of new idea. Uh, or, or I said new field probably, not necessarily new ideas. Uh, th it takes time and consistent effort, and a lot of the other presenters will also be talking about that. Uh, it's not something over, always staying on your toes and constantly investing in, in new things. So, thank you. <laughs>